Oh. Okay. So hello, everybody. I'm Karen Sullivan, publisher of Arenda Books, and I'm thrilled to see you here tonight um, to celebrate publication of three extraordinary books, books that you will know are part of our jubilant June campaign. And as it suggests, they will soothe your soul and warm your heart. And they're books that I promise you will never forget. Um, I'm gonna keep this quick because we have three authors to look after today, three glorious authors. Um, so quickly, if you haven't met us before, we're a small independent publishing company in London. Um, we, oh, I see someone I know saying hello there. Hi, Joe. <laughs> um, we publish literary fiction with a heavy emphasis on crime thrillers um, and about half of our list is in translation and our representative tonight is Helga Flatland from Norway. Um, we won the Crime and Mystery Publisher of the Year last year and we were shortlisted for Small Press of the Year in the British Book Awards, but there is no crime tonight. Um, it's all about straight literary fiction and some of the most beautiful books that you will ever read. So we have our wonderful debut, Katie Allen, and she's coming to us from London from my own street, in fact. Um, and she's talking about her poignant, um, immensely moving debut, uh, Everything Happens for a Reason. Um, this was a book I knew I had to publish and everyone who reads it will know exactly why. Um, from Hall is our wonderful Louise Beach. And Louise is one of the first authors that I ever published at Aranda Books. Um, she's an extraordinarily talented author um, and her characters and emotive themes have won her a legion of loyal readers around the world. And the stunning This Is How We Are Human is undoubtedly the best one yet. Um, in fact, I was just looking at her ratings on Amazon and I think it's almost exclusively five-star reviews, which is always a good thing. Um, and then from Norway, we have the exceptional literary talent Helga Flatland, um, who has won multiple awards in her home country for her searingly perceptive novels um, about the fragility of human relationships. Um, her razor sharp, bittersweet novel, um, oh, I was going to hold all the books up um, one last time, um, will we'll transfix you every bit as much as her English debut, A Modern Family, did, um, which was one of our best-selling books of 2019. Um, sadly, we won't have Rosie Hedger, um, our translator here tonight, because she's got a sick new baby, um, but we, she's with us in spirit and we send her all good wishes and huge thanks. She's immensely talented. Um, so taking the chair tonight, we have Alex Clark, who is a journalist and broadcaster, often seen on the pages of The Guardian, Times Literary Supplement and The Observer, and heard on BBC Radio 4 programs like Front Row and Open Book. Um, she's an experienced chair of live events and patron of the Cambridge Literary Festival and director of the Bath Literary Festival in the past. Um, the literary awards that she has judged include the Man Booker Prize and the Orwell Prize, and she lives in Kilkenny, Ireland. Um, so welcome, Alex, and thank you so much for leading the proceedings tonight. So it's Independent Bookshop Week, and we are very proud to partner with Dulwich Books for this event. Um, we would urge you to support this little brilliant independent, um, and you can get exclusive signed copies of all of these books there. Um, you can contact them on Twitter, which is at Dulwich Books, or by email, which is hello at dulwichbooks.co.uk. And if you buy all three books, you get one of these, Jubilant June um, tote bags, exclusive. And we will also have one of these to give away at the end for the best question as voted by the authors here tonight. Um, if you do have a question, it would be great if you could use the question and answer facility at the bottom of your screen. And I'm gonna hand things over now to Alex and have a wonderful evening. So looking forward to this. And thank you, thank you so much. Um, well, you don't have to leave that quickly. We're not going <laughs> to face you off the screen. Um, thank you so much. That was such a, a, a generous and warm introduction. And it's so wonderful to be doing this event with Arenda, um, which I'm going to say, because Karen didn't say it herself, are indeed a small independent uh, publisher, but also your brainchild, Karen. Is oh, yes. That right. You Definitely. Actually, you founded the company in 2010, I think. 2014. 2014. Sorry. Um, I have that in my notes and I'm already misreading my <laughs> notes. <laughs> okay. um, and what I didn't know, and it's just such a kind of act of, I know, creative passion and also faith to do something like 
you know, invent a whole new publisher in a really cutthroat world of publishing giants. And it's yes. just gone. Naivety gets you far. <laughs> well, that I think it's also something that I didn't know, which is what arenda means. Arenda is a Canadian First Nations word, isn't it? Yes, that's that, right. That you explain, it means something like the mystical power that drives human accomplishment. Exactly. Which is kind of, we all need a bit of a render. That's what yeah, I We all need a bit of a render. I hope that a render is like, I will stop talking to you now, Karen, so you, you may exit and just enjoy the event. If I'm you looking will. forward to it. Thank and you, Alex. We're going to welcome our three fantastic authors. I'm going to have to just start with something that was thrown up by that introduction. Katie, you live on the same street <laughs> as your publisher. Now, I, I just need to unpack that story a bit. Were you literally just, kind of, did you bump into each other in the street? And did Karen say, you know, have you got to kind of publish a book? How did it work? I just have to know. It was almost, almost that easy. So um, I knew of Karen, so we live on an extremely friendly street in South London, sort of slightly on the outskirts of London. And uh, we have a street party every two years. And Karen is known as the lady who makes amazing cakes, like, you know, the kinds you get in a cake show, like professional bake-off levels, showstopper cakes. And she always does them to each theme. So she's done Alice in Wonderland. She did Space at the last one. And so I knew, I followed her on Twitter and I was just finishing an MA. I'd literally handed in my manuscript, I think two days before the street party that I was helping organise. And I was like chatting to her by the cakes. And I, she'd been she'd been writing about something about piracy in books, and I I used to be a journalist covering piracy. So we started chatting, and I said oh, I've done this MA and I've done this manuscript, and she said, "Oh, will you send it to me?" And I was sort of just asking for advice about where do I go next, what do I do about an agent? And she said, "Oh, send it to me." And I said, "Oh, no, 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 don't be silly. You're just being polite because I'm a neighbour. You know, bear in mind we don't really know each other. I knew of her, and she maybe knew of me as the person who sent persistent emails about street parties." And so I went home that evening you know, I woke up the next day and I was like oh my god if a publisher asks you to send a manuscript and you don't do it out of politeness then you're a complete you know you're an absolute fool so I sent her I sort of sent her this email saying like it's so kind of you to ask don't feel you have to read it you know blah blah sent it to her and then a few weeks later she emailed back having read it and there we are yeah Wow, so and the rest of the rest of it's yeah, just really really lucky that I guess it fell into the right hands um at the right time so well me being a sort of you know gloomy kind of pessimistic person on occasion not tonight but with my pessimism I think oh my god what if she hated it you'd literally just have to you'd never be able to go to a street party again and you wouldn't get the cakes or wouldn't she would cake. oh my god oh nerve-wracking I'm just gonna kind of come to each of you and, and just ask you about how how your books have come into being and then we're going to talk a little bit about each of these new books. I'm gonna to come to you again and, and ask you just to set the scene for people who haven't yet had the pleasure. I have, and I enjoyed all three so immensely. They're such feats of storytelling, each of them. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a bit of a, a conversation between all of us, as if we were all in the same room together, as if we were in the Dulwich bookshop. So Louise, um, just explain to us how you, this is your seventh novel, isn't it? Yes, number seven. So you have been with uh, Karen for a, a long time and just tell us how that relationship came about. Well, I was also, I was kind of a bit cheeky. That seems to be involved a lot with the Arenda authors, doesn't it? A bit of something happening out of the blue, a bit cheeky. Um, I was actually on the train coming home from um, an awards event um, in, at the end of 2014 and my debut novel, How To Be Brave, it had shortlisted for this award um, and then it hadn't won. And I had sent the, the book plus four of my other books to every agent and every publisher in the UK and I'd been rejected by everybody. And I was coming home from London on the train having not, not won this award and I was in a really, really sad place. And I happened to go on Twitter and I happened to see this woman called Karen who was starting her own publishing company and it was the way she described the books that she wanted to publish, which was beautiful, unique, can't remember the other word, but it just spoke to me. And I thought, this is so unprofessional. 
to tweet somebody. It's just not what you're supposed to do. But I thought, what the heck? I've got nothing to lose right now. And so I just tweeted Karen and told her a bit about how to be brave and kind of the journey I'd had. And she said, do you know what? Send, send it to me. And this was in um, October, I think, of 2014. Anyway, I didn't hear and Christmas passed and I didn't hear and I didn't hear. And I just thought, oh, not to worry. She maybe doesn't like it. And then, not that I remember the date, but the 9th of February, <laughs> Dean, at 9am in the morning, I get this email back finally from Karen, but it opened with, I'm really sorry. So I just stopped reading and walked away really sadly. Oh. oh my word, another rejection. I just couldn't take it. And then I thought, that's a really long email for a no. So I went back and she actually said, I'm really sorry I took so long to get back to you, but I love your book and I would love to publish it. You can't how that oh, good, good lesson not to, you know, really not to only read the first line of something and then walk <laughs> away. Thank God you didn't press delete. Um, <laughs> Helga, of course, for you, you're, you're published in Norway with a Norwegian publisher uh, and your books are translated into, into other languages. So a render is your UK publisher that's a that's a really interesting relationship isn't it for for you to have a relationship with someone who is bringing your books to a whole new language market just just tell us a bit about that relationship absolutely and it's fantastic because uh being translated into english was sort of a dream for me because i was i had published four novels five novels no, four novels before uh, A Modern Family was translated as the first to be translated into English. And it was such a huge milestone for me to be translated into a world language. So that was really, really cool. But it was my agent at my uh, at Oslo Literary Agency that uh, called me one day after A Modern Family and told me, well, there's uh, this cool independent English uh, publishing house that wants to publish a modern family. And uh, then I got emails from all my Norwegian colleagues uh, like um, Thomas Enger and Gunnar Storvsen. And everybody was just crazy about Karen and Narenda. They said, you have to go for her, you have to go for it. So there you go. So A Modern Family, which was your, your last book, wasn't it? And it, it, it again uh, did what you're doing a little bit in this uh, book one last time which is to talk about the relationships within families and between generations and so let's just talk a little bit about one last time a modern family was about uh, a couple in their 70s I think who yeah. divorce and the fallout for their children who are just you know horrified by, by what's going to happen <laughs> um, this goes to a very quickly one last time goes to a very much more somber place in a way. Just tell us a little bit about the book, set, set the scene for us. Yeah, well, it's about three generations of women in Norway. Uh, it's about Anna and Sigrid and Mia. And they sort of live out their roles as mothers and daughters in different ways. And all three have to think things through when and redefine their roles when uh, Anna, the oldest one, gets terminally ill and that highlights both her own as well as Sigrid and Mia's expectations to each other and to Anna. So that's mm -hmm. sort of the, the storyline. And you, you tell the story from different points of view, which is again something, something that we'll talk about. You, you all have interesting formal technical ways of telling your stories, which I was very sort of struck by how you've all done kind of different things in a straightforward first or third person narrative. And here what we see in, in your book, um, uh, um, Helga, is that you are talking about a woman who is reaching the end of her life um, wondering how to negotiate that in terms of what she will leave behind with her daughter and mm. how her daughter will cope and how her daughter's daughter will cope. Just tell us about inhabiting those different worldviews because they, there are lots of ways that they're separated by experience, of course, and also there's that very interesting divide in the novel between town and countryside living, different ways of life. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm from the countryside myself, but I've lived in Oslo uh, for the last, I think, 20 years uh, now. So, so that was in, important for me, uh, also the politics of it. But, but to, uh, for me, writing is to 
go into the, a person and to live through that person. So it's kind of like uh, acting, I think. I have a friend that's actor and we, we talk about it in, in sort of the same ways that, that when I have to, when I'm writing about Anna, who is like uh, 67 years old with cancer and has uh, a life that's very uh, strange to me, actually. I, I, I don't know her, I don't know her life, but I have to imagine her life. And so to... Uh, for me, it's like, yeah, it's like acting and then writing it out on, on, uh, in the novel instead of acting it out in real life. And the younger generation, the generation that's, that's uh, well, sort of the middle generation, I suppose, mm. uh, that is, is Sigrid's generation, of course, her life hasn't been traditional in a sense. Her marriage has broken up. She has a new marriage. So she has a kind of blended family in a, in a way. Mm. And these are very tough things and they're very tough uh, things to negotiate when she thinks about losing her mother. Yeah, because she blames her mother <laughs> for yeah. all of her relationships problems. And she says she she has all, her whole life. She has been she has felt that she has been let down in her childhood by her mother. And she she explains her whole life and all their all its flaws with uh, her mother not caring enough when she was a child. And when uh, her mother uh, is dying, she has this urge for an apology, for uh, an explanation, or that her mother at least will uh, acknowledge the fact that she has not been there in the way that Sigrid means that she should have been. So that's her sort of her goal throughout the novel is to is to get that apology, to get that confrontation, and to. Mm -hmm sort of uh, forgive her. But I don't think that Sigrid uh, with that conversation or with that confrontation or with that apology would have got what she needed because it's the child Sigrid that needs that apology and not the adult one. So as an adult, she's sort of like looking for other ways to, to uh, explain her life through her mother. But I don't think that's where the answers are lying actually. No, we, we, we sort of begin to piece together where they might be lying or indeed the, the problem of the things that we think we need. And, and that's very much a part, thank you very much, Helga. Um, that's very much at the forefront, I think, of, of your book, Katie, too. Somebody in kind of desperate trauma uh, in everything happens for a reason. Um, in the aftermath of a terrible trauma, but feeling that there is a way out, but sort of mistaking what that way out might be. I wonder if you'd just tell us a bit about, about the book. Yeah, so it begins with a character called Rachel, who um, three weeks before we meet her, she's um, pregnant, everything's gone well, very, you know, normal pregnancy, everything's ready, a baby that she was desperate to have, tried for a while. And the day that she's in labor, the baby just stops kicking. She goes to hospital expecting to be reassured and he dies and he's stillborn. And so we meet her three weeks on, her husband is back at work, she's home in this empty house where she should be with a baby on maternity leave and she's not. And someone, and the title from the book comes from something someone says to her, a sort of well-meaning person tries to say, well, says to her, everything happens for a reason. And she's in that phase of, of grief where everything sort of, you're sort of hypersensitive and, you know, anyone, I suppose everyone grieves differently, but in my case, I find anything anyone says to you, you sort of grasp onto it and you remember the words better or you remember that moment when, you know, you get the news of a death, everything sort of slows down, uh, which I suppose is a cliche, but I think it's true that everything, you're sort of, like I say, you're hypersensitive and Rachel, my character, describes it as phrasal retentiveness. So anything anyone utters to or anything that's said in a condolence card or just in passing, poor them, Rachel just grasps onto it like anything, pulls it apart. And she, and to be fair, you know, she, these poor people, she's sort of waiting to be angry, a bit like, you know, your, your character Sigrid, who's sort of waiting for that apology. And there's a moment in um, Helga's book where she's really happy that her partner initiates a confrontation. She doesn't even care what it's about. And it's that kind of like, I'm just looking for a confrontation here. I'm just looking for someone to be angry at, right? Because life is not, you know, cancer, baby death. Life has dealt me this blow and who do I take my anger out on? So yes, like you, like you say, Alex, she sort of slightly goes down a few tunnels that she perhaps shouldn't in her quest to make everything make sense. Um, and I suppose it's the most nonsensical thing when someone suddenly dies very unexpectedly 
that she'll do anything to make it make sense. And obviously there's nothing that can really undo it apart from learning to, gosh, I don't want to say any platitudes now because I don't want to be like the people in the book, but if I, you know, I suppose you do need to just learn to live with it, don't you? you you're, you're left behind, what do, you, what do you do, I suppose? Well, I think one of the things that, that comes across so, so strongly, which is that, uh, you, you know, is how you've actually constructed the book, is that one of the things, whatever kind of loss people suffer, they're desperate in a way to carry on the relationship, to carry yeah. on talking to the person that they've lost. And this in a very kind of bold sort of maneuver is what Rachel does, isn't it? Yeah, and that struck me part way through writing. I, I say she started off in the third person, in the early pages, and then she was first person for a bit. And then I just thought, do you know, what? what how would she tell her story if she actually physically had to be you know, put on the spot of who are you talking to here? The only person she'd really want to be with in that year is that baby. So there we go. It's a bit of a spoiler, but it's only a few pages in that you find that out. Sorry. Well, it's <laughs> <laughs> everyone who hasn't read it. But yeah, that's, I mean, so that, and then I sort of think, oh, is that too weird that she's, you know, and uh, she set up this email account and starts emailing him. And I, I have that email account. I set it up so no one else can take it. Um, and I check it every so often, which feels a bit weird. Um, and I thought, oh, is that a bit weird? And then I've noticed, I think when you when you see news stories, they sort of quote about you know, tragedies that have happened. They quote the family going on Facebook and you see these posts where it says, you would this and you are this and you, uh, they, it's second person, you know, it's not about the same, but it's, it's addressing a you very strongly. And I think, yeah, that's exactly what you say. It's like anything to get, because all we really want when we're grieving is to have the person back, don't we? And it's yes, it's yes. quite simple. Right. And I'm, I'm, I love that while we were talking about something so poignant, because I don't think that you should worry that you've given people spoilers. There is that moment of puzzlement in the first few pages of your book where you think, who is she writing to? Uh, but it really is only the first few pages. And then you're kind of gripped by this idea that this is what she's doing. And what I must say, I did find incredibly striking was that she continues to do it. That is Mm. That is what the book is. And, and that's a, that was a very bold and interesting move, I thought. And it, it must have been one that, that you really had to sort of keep faith with, as you've been describing, really. Because <laughs> right, that's the thing, like, you don't want in an epistolary novel, you know, something written as letters or diaries, you can't, it'd be really tempting to just mope and just have thoughts. And you sort of, I needed action, I think, that the story, because Rachel, you know, I knew it was going to take place over a year, and I knew I wanted her to end up in a better place. And I knew I needed her to track down someone. And you know, again, that's part of the story. So I needed actually, so it was like, it was the first line of every email I found really hard. So the subject lines I had a lot of fun with, but then it was that first line of, you can't, you can't do a usual email like, hi, hope you're well. You know, you can't do that obviously, but you can't also say yesterday a funny thing happened. You have to a bit like in a chapter, you just go in on a quote it still needs to sound a bit like an email so that was a pain sometimes and I and then once I got the voice it got easier it's easy and what was nice is some of the emails are short and I just got my puppy part way through writing so I realized I couldn't work in my office like normal so I took the laptop downstairs and every time there was a break I was kind of like quick quick a quick Rachel email um in between puppy stuff so that but it lent itself to puppy puppy time you see, they never say that on writing courses or in how-to guides. This is the kind of writing that works really well if you're housebreaking a new puppy. Mm. But perhaps they should. You have to sit around life as it comes to you. Uh, Louise, obviously, we've already touched on your relationship with emails, which is that you just walk away from them if you think they might have bad news. But although you're, not, you're never going to do that again, we've agreed. Um, your book is is so this is how we are human which is uh well you have very interesting titles this is your seventh book and they all have very strong and interesting and intriguing titles um but what your book is essentially isn't it it's a free hander in a way uh with these three extraordinary characters just tell us a little bit about them okay so um we have veronica who is a 55 year old mum of a young autistic man called Sean. Sorry, that's, sorry, Sebastian. I, I, no, I said Sean, that's the real life character that inspired him. Wow, so in the book is Sebastian, sorry. Um, and 
Sebastian, he is 20 and he tells you regularly exactly how old he is in months and days. And he just wants what most young men of that age, he wants to meet a girl, he wants to find love, but mostly he wants to have sex. And he's finding it quite troublesome because he is autistic. And so when he gets chatting to young girls, they don't quite know how to take him. They probably make him nervous. Um, he gets bullied at college because he hasn't had a girlfriend. And so Veronica, his mum, like most mums, she just wants to make him happy. So she mm. tries to get help. There isn't any help. They go to a sexual health clinic. There's no advice. It's usually just, you know, does he want to be sedated with drugs? We're not really sure what to recommend. Maybe read up what consent is. And they meet their, um, a trainee nurse called Isabel. And she really kind of bonds with Sebastian. She's just got no judgment. She just has an immediately warm connection with him. So Veronica, um, she makes the decision eventually to seek out an escort to have sex with Sebastian. And she happens upon uh, the nurse in question, Isabel, who has her own difficulties in life. She has to pay for her father's care, uh, her university course where she's trained to be a nurse. And so she is doing this basically to pay for her family. So the three of them come together in this way. The only problem is that Veronica doesn't tell Sebastian that she is paying Isabel because she wants Sebastian to believe that someone like Isabel would be interested in him. So I won't say much more than that to ruin it, but you can obviously imagine the fallout, you know, what, what could happen as a result of this huge decision, which came from, um, some real life friends the the young man is inspired by a real life friend and his mum went through the same dilemma she didn't go down the same avenue as veronica but they did think about it and that was what got me thinking wow there's a story that needs to be explored it's it's, it's really interesting because the way that you describe the book and thinking of your other books which I go into all sorts of, you know, crime and thriller and supernatural and historical. Um, you're describing a, a sort of situ a real life situation that obviously has complications and difficulties attached to it. But you're also describing an almost in a fictional sense, almost sort of comical setup. These three characters with different ideas. Things can go wrong, misunderstandings happen. And bringing that kind of uh, degree of humour to the book seemed to me, as I was reading it, pretty sort of key to you. Yeah, um, Sebastian has a fantastic sense of humour. And because he says things exactly as they are, a lot of what he um, notices around him. And when it comes to the point of view, I decided right at the start that Sebastian would be the only first person voice because I wanted him to have the strongest voice. I wanted his voice to rise above everyone else's, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. Isabel and Veronica are third person. So they're still close, but just a little bit more distance from them. Whereas Sebastian, you know, is front and center, first person. <laughs> and and you, you mentioned there that the inspiration came from some friends and you observed their life. I mean, people often feel a great deal of sort of trepidation are writing about subjects that want their immediate experience that have obviously sensitivities and complications around them. Mm. At the same time, you don't want to overburden everything with lots and lots of research. You're telling a story at the same time. How did you sort of tread that line? Uh, I was nervous because obviously there's a fantastic um, own voices movement, which um, is encouraging mm people from diverse groups to hit, so that we hear their stories firsthand. And I didn't want to step any to on any toes when writing a neurodiverse character, obviously. So I did meet with Fiona and Sean, my real life friends. We did act out certain scenes. I did consult with Sean a lot to get the voice right because I knew that I really couldn't get this one wrong. I think um, I could have probably upset a lot of people. So I was nervous, but that maybe made me um, I don't know, just work extra hard on, mm. on making sure that I was sensitive. Yeah. There was a question that I was going to ask you, but actually it's it's all of you. Um, but uh, we have a, a question from the audience and they kind of slightly sort of intersect. And I, I wanted to say hello to Alexander Hawley, who's asking this question. Uh, he says it's the first literary event that he's been to. So we say 
big welcome. Thank you very much for coming. And he says, as somebody who normally reads Arenda's crime novels, uh, please could you tell me what was the biggest challenges are in writing a literary novel? And that's a really, really good question. And it also, I thought it was, it, it would talk also perhaps to a lot of things that have been, I've been thinking about as I've been thinking about these three books together. They're about what we might call domestic subjects. They're about interior lives, about how things work in families, things that are often put into kind of brackets when it comes to books. I don't know if you think of your books as literary in that sense. They're certainly they're not genre in that they're not crime novels, uh, for example. But I don't know, I'm gonna start with Helga there because Helga, you come with this fabulous tag attached to you of the Norwegian Anne Tyler, which must be something that, you know, I'd like to be the anything Anne Tyler, I think that must be kind of marvelous. But of course, one of the things that also does is say, oh, you you know, this is a sort of area that you're in. And I just wonder how you all feel about that, but I'll start with Helga if I can. Uh, excuse me, about what, 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 what? About how you feel about that idea of what is literary, what is a women's woman's subject? What are the challenges that, that come to you as you sit down to write a book? Because again, you've written books in very, very different kind of areas. You know, we've written novels set in Afghanistan, but you know, very different things. Just, just yeah. take- Well, I, I don't think about my novels in, in, in any kind of genre. Like when I sit down to write, it's just writing to me. And I've been writing as long as I can remember. So it's just sort of me writing something and then the readers or the audience or the publishing house are saying this is that obviously it's not crime it's I, I know that but but for me I'm not uh, so uh, occupied by defining it in one way or the other it, it is what it is and then the readers will decide what it if, if they want to put it in, in some kind of category or or anything I I, I don't know it, it's up to them but the challenge in in for me in writing is to create believable characters so that they're not um, caricature, caricature, mm -hmm. yeah, like yes. So yeah. so it's it's like they have to be complex and they have to be. Uh, if I'm writing about a, a woman, it's 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 crucial to me that she's everything <laughs> a human being, not just a woman or not just a man or not. Nobody's evil. Nobody's all good. They're they're complex, and that's the most challenging thing I think to to make them believable as human beings because they're sort of reflecting a real life human being and then, then they have to inhabit all that uh, all that we are actually as human beings and that's challenging but that's part of the fun yes and you do you think I mean just to come back to that idea of style finding a different style for each of the books um how have you sort of negotiated that as you've as you've gone through your writing career? Well, I think that's sort of the same answer that that I'm. Uh, it's up to the characters that I'm choosing, right? So, so if An Anna and Sigrid is telling the story, it's like their style that tells the story. And when I wrote about three young boys leaving for the war in Afghanistan, it was their voice that carried the story. And then. I have to go into the mind of, of a 70 year old adventurous boy who wants to seek adventure and then uh, try to tell the story through his eyes. So they, they are defining my style, so, so to speak, because I'm always writing in first person. So it's, it's sort of them telling all the stories and then they are defining the style that I'm writing in. Yes, thank you. Um, Katie, think, I mean, obviously, you know, there, there are challenges when you write your first novel. I know that this was also a novel that did draw on your own experience. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering about the challenges uh, that you found, whether you thought of it as a, a literary novel, what you really felt about it as you were going about it. So I suppose technically, so my MA was called literary fiction, which I find is a really bit of a weird term because I, I don't want it to exclude people, you know, you want stuff, you want, I, I, I totally agree with Helgi, the main thing for me is character driven and I think about the books that I read, if I don't fall for a character that's it for me, so I, I just really need the character, you know, I, 
from the first pages of Louise's, which starts with a scene with Veronica. Well, sorry, the first pages of Sebastian, aren't they? But that scene with Veronica in the sexual health clinic, I'm like, okay, this, this, I'm, I'm with this woman. Well, I suppose you pick favourites, don't you? And it's lovely that there are different voices, but she was like, I was like, I, so I think for me, it's sort of strong characters in, yeah, I can speak more about what I read than what I've written, given this is my first book. I think strong characters, I don't know, literary is a hard one, isn't it? Because I really think mm. you could end up excluding people. I suppose if I was really like pushed to define it, I'd say perhaps it's a book that doesn't give you all the answers, that leaves you with perhaps some questions, you know, so you finish the book and you're, you're maybe on one character's side, maybe on the other. And I think you could say that with all three of our books, that yeah, there's nothing too dogmatic about them, that all three of them leave you with, with questions as well as perhaps some answers that you don't, you shouldn't expect absolute closure. At, you know, it's nice to have a story with a beginning and an end, but you should come away, you know, not, not having been spoon fed and not having all the answers. I suppose that for me would possibly be literary, but I'm quite wary of the term because I just don't like anything exclusive. And I feel like that's what publishers are for. They, they decide what covers work well and they decide what taglines work well or strap lines, whatever you call them. They would decide on the blurb. Oh my God, like I could not come up with a good blurb, I don't think. And I feel that's as a as a um as a writer, that's where it's quite good to be humble. And that's perhaps easier as a debut to say, do you know what? That's not my specialty, either the genre. I don't organize the books in water stones on the shelves. I don't do blurbs, like I don't, I'm not an artist, I don't do covers. So yeah, that was that be how I see myself as genre. I cast the book. You mentioned um, right at the beginning, didn't you, that you'd worked in journalism. You had been a journalist for a, a long time. Um, so the, the sort of, you know, the impetus is there of communicating information, yeah, yeah. Um, doing it in a way that is impartial and balanced and will tell the reader as much of the story that they need to know and more. Um, I mean, this is a very, very different discipline, isn't it? Um, I wonder, because, you know, you, you could have written this story as a piece of non-fiction, but it was yeah. clearly very, very important to you to make it an imaginative journey. Yeah, it was. Um, so, yeah, so just to come back, I think you, you just mentioned, so it's the starting point was that between my two children, my, my son Finn was stillborn, um, very much the same as in the book. Like, you know, we were on nine months, a um, few days from his due date, same situation. Um, so I suppose it came to me, yes, I do want to put that in a not I don't know why. I ne it never crossed my mind to write it as some sort of memoir. I just, I had Rachel really strongly in my head and maybe, you know, a psychologist would say I needed that buffer between me and the reality. I found writing about, you know, doing a couple of press pieces while the books come out that, you know, about my story and I found those emotionally much more draining. You know, mm. fewer words, thank goodness, but um, much more draining to write emotionally and I think with Rachel I have that buffer of she's fictional um, it's happened to her not me like I say psychotherapists would have a field day with this um, but yeah I suppose and uh, yeah it, the nice thing compared with journalism is you can make stuff up <laughs> and um, and I think the lesson for me was like sometimes you you, you can't over explain as a journalist everything has to be sourced you know you know this everything has to be sourced you have to know it's true you have to check it I didn't have to phone anyone to check whether stuff was true I didn't have to go on the you know, national statistics website and look stuff up although I would say that the statistics that are in the book were all true because I kind of let my own job get into that this bit about death statistics at one point those were all true at the time of writing <laughs> couldn't help myself but yeah so that was quite liberating in a way mm. it's quite fun um, Louise, we were just just sort of mentioning uh, a few minutes ago, weren't we? Or you know that there are lots of different kinds of books that you've written, and lots. I mean, you're not clearly a writer who wants to be confined by one kind of story. I don't know whether you think of yourself as sort of, I don't know, borrow it or, or going on holiday to a particular genre or how it works for you. Or whether you think of this book as a literary novel. I mean, I think we're all sort of in a, a consensus that it's a very kind of shifting sort of term and, and we wonder in a way how kind of helpful it is to us but what's your take on it? I read a really really great quote this week from a writer um, I can't remember who it was I'm really sorry if I remember I'll, I'll say um, and he said if you write your truth you'll find your voice and it's that just really really resonated it was the kind of thing I thought I'm writing that one down and my books I find that they have um, kind of the strongest voice if we're talking literary fiction because often I think literary fiction is a very strong voice and a very strong, very strong style mm. 
I find that the books that come from a really true place, because really isn't all fiction built on truth, you know, <laughs> we are in our books. We can deny it all we want, but we are there as authors, aren't we, hidden uh, mm. between the words. Um, yeah, the, the ones, yeah, like How To Be Brave um, was inspired by my grandfather's true life story and my daughter being ill. And then Maria in the Moon, I often call that the memoir I could never write like Katie said about distancing yourself from something that really happened to you. If we write it as fiction, it's a little bit safer to explore it, isn't it? Mm. It's safer mm. to look at it. Um, and then obviously the most recent one was inspired by truth. I think I find that that just drives me the most, that I'm the most compelled, even if it isn't an actual truth, even if it's just that I feel the heart of it and the characters are pulsing there, because like both of, of the ladies said, it's, it's character-led is often the thing with literary, isn't it? Where it's the nuances of character and relationships, isn't it? Um, like the human condition is often a word people say, isn't it? When we're talking about literary fiction. But I just write a story that comes to me. Uh, I never think about the genre each time I set off with a book. We, we have a, another question from Joanne who asks, was there a book, and we're talking about inspirations and things, was there a book that you read that inspired you to want to become a writer? Um, so let's let's think about that question, but I'm, I'm going to just expand it a bit just to when you first did want to become a writer. Now I keep pointing at people, but I'm going to, who would like to start that? Because I feel too too bossy otherwise. Who'd like to start there? I can start that because I have quite a strong view and I have a little. So um, I absolutely love the American author A.M. Holmes. And I think her favourite book of mine is May We Be Forgiven. And I, I go on about her online all the time. Um, and that's, that's first person, present tense. And I think I was rereading that and I just thought, God, I want to do this. I want to just have somebody. And that's set exactly over a year which I think I must have basically nicked from her when I decided that Rachel would be over a year. And I think it was that. And then she was at an event. I sort of decided to do this MA, quit journalism. And she was at an event in London and there was a book signing afterwards. So I went up and I said to her, um, do you know what? You've inspired me to try and be a novelist. And she was really, really nice. Um, she's like, and she said, the one thing she said was, she's like, just make, just promise me you'll finish. So I don't know if that's what happens. People sort of say, and then they don't finish, but she was really adamant. She said, actually promise me you'll finish. And then she spent the rest of the time talking to my friend who's next to me, who she found much more interesting. So that was a bit heartbreaking, but I remembered her words. And <laughs> my friend whose name she found more interesting and generally more interesting, but never mind. Um, but yeah, she kept saying, she said, promise me and finish. So then the whole time I was writing, I was like, this person who inspired me made me promise I'd finish. I've since emailed her and said, you made me promise I'd finish my novel. I promise. Can I send you a proof? But she hasn't replied. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess, she, I guess there'll be a way that that book will get to her and somebody will get that book to her, I would imagine. Um, the, just literally the thought when you said book signing, uh, I have to ask you about your own particularly idiosyncratic way of signing books. Me? Yes. Oh, because there's, there well, there's a sausage dog in there. There's a sausage dog in the book. Um, there's also a toucan, a, a soft one um, called Tukin, but I can't draw toucans and I can draw sausage dogs. So <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the sausage dog. Um, yeah, I get, he's quite a nice little sort of, what's the word, motif, isn't it, a sausage dog? And he's quite like, he's quite fun. I think he brings some humour to the book and some relief. So um, Exactly, exactly. Fun. The, so the dog think. component of the book is, is a, a very nice touch, I thought, and I very much enjoyed seeing your little dachshunds I couldn't draw, as well as that. Um, Helga, what, what about you? And, and obviously your may well be drawing on a whole range of Norwegian literature. Um, just tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I think uh, I have a lot of uh, influence as, a, as an adult, uh, but I think the most important writer for me was when I was a child and I, I learned to read and read Astrid Lindgren uh, as a child because my mother would always read Astrid Lindgren uh, when I was going to bed and she would finish before I, and I was like no one more chapter please one more chapter and she was like no so I, I actually learned to read because I wanted to finish the, the her novels and then 
uh, I think this is, this is Pippi Longstocking. Yes, it's yes. Pippi Longstocking. So. It's maybe the most famous, but she has so beautifully written uh, children novels that everybody should check them out. But but she, I think she inspired me to want to to want to be a writer as the first one because I actually did copy her novels and changed just a few of her names in her novels and then wrote the whole thing from start <laughs> to end as, as I was maybe eight years old or something so wow. I think she, she's still the, my, my, my biggest influence but, but there's also of course uh, fantastic Norwegian writers at, in the history of, like Tari Aveso who has been translated into English I know and he has been uh, so inspiring to me so there's and I, and I love to promote Norwegian literature because they're so it's so so it's a small country, but there are so many great writers here. So yes. I'm lucky to be a part of that, that. And that's part of the reason I'm I'm a writer myself because I'm surrounded by amazing writers. Yeah, and it's it is an amazing literary culture, isn't it? And I, I have to say, I also grew up reading Pippi Longstocking, but I was a very great devotee, of, I believe, another Norwegian uh, children's writer, Alf Prusen. Yeah. Uh, and I loved Mrs. Pepperpot and her transformations into a pepperpot sized <laughs> woman. And the idea of Cloudberry Jam more than I can remember. I adored those books. So very thank you to the to Norwegian children's literature. Um, Louis, oh, I do have a, a, an additional question. It was somebody who says, Louise and Helga, do you also draw pictures when you sign your books? <laughs> no, no way, I can't draw a thing. <laughs> Louise, first you draw pictures and, and then, uh, then, then talk to us about the book that you read that inspired you. Um, I do draw pictures and I will get into a lot of trouble if I say what I draw, but anyone here probably knows what I draw often in my book. That's all I'm going to say on that matter. Because <laughs> somebody might shut me out of this chat and slap me on the hand. <laughs> um, and with regards um, reading, very much like Helga, it was when I was young and my be first beloved book was Heidi by Joanna Spirey, a Swiss writer. And I wrote my own sequel, very much like Helga. It inspired me to want to write. So I wrote my own sequel to Heidi with diagrams. And from the age of eight or nine, I filled exercise books, literally had chapters, um, diagrams, epilogue, prologue. Um, and I used to tell everyone when I was that age that one day I was going to be a world famous novelist. So I've still got a bit of work to do, but you know. <laughs> Well, uh, I, that is a fantastically wide-ranging set of answers there. Pippi Longstocking, Heidi, and A.M. Holmes, who is not awfully like Pippi Longstocking or Heidi, I don't think. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Ellie Sisson asks, uh, she says it's a quick question, but actually I think there's, you could answer this at length if you so wish. How do you deal with the blank page? And um, boy, is that a question that affects pretty much everyone I think I'm throwing that over okay Louise I'm going to go to you on that one I know everyone's going to hate me but I, I very rarely get writer's block um <laughs> I write like I talk as in I never shut up and I never stop writing <laughs> um so far touch wood fingers crossed I don't tend to have a problem with the blank page. I, I just see it as this joyful thing that's there for me to fill. <laughs> that's the best way I can describe it. Wow. Um, <laughs> but if, if for some reason I couldn't write the chapter I'm supposed to be writing, I genuinely would just write something else until kind of the juices were flowing and then come back to what I'm supposed to be writing. I can see you, you nodding, Helga. Is that, yeah. is, that the same, is that the same for you? Well, I do get writer's block, though, uh, but but I think it's people have this uh, sort of mystical uh, imagination that we are just inspired all the time and that we are writers who have to be inspired all the time to write. But that's obviously not true. You can't be inspired all the time. At least I can't. So so I think of it also as as uh, work. I sit down and I, I'm telling myself I have to right now uh, this is my office time and I'm writing it right now and then I obviously write something that's and I, I allow myself to write something that's extremely bad and 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 uh, not good at all and then I just go back in a few days when I'm more inspired or when I'm through the block and then think okay that's that's the editing phase but but to just think of it as work uh, works for me 
But that that um something that writers often say, and it clearly does work. Just write something. It's important to get something written. You can go back, or mm. it will lead you to a better place. One thing that's always struck me is how you get the distance to kind of know that something's good or bad. Um, you know, if something's working or not working seems to me almost as important a part of the writer's job mm. as getting the words on the page and actually being able to get distance. How do you do that? Well, it's, it's very difficult to be a good reader of your own uh, mm. novel or your own writing. It's, it's almost, as you say, impossible. But for me, it's more like, uh, it's more of a, I can feel it when I'm writing something good and I can feel it when I'm writing something bad. And then the feeling will stuck with me when I read it uh, sometime from when I wrote it. It's, 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 um, it's the same feeling most of the time that this is not good. And I, I know that because I know the feeling when I wrote it was not good. So I think it's more like sort of a sense of something more than it, uh, than somebody can say this is not good or this is good. But, but it's, it's my own sense of the novel of, of my own writing and the condition I, I was writing it in. A sort of gut feeling, in yeah, a way. Yeah, yeah, gut feeling. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, uh, Katie is, I mean, again, you're at the beginning of a writing journey or a publishing journey, or fiction writing, certainly. Um, how about you? How's it been for you? Yeah, I suppose I, I, I totally agree. It's very hard to judge good and bad. And I think that was the lovely thing about doing it as an MA is you're in a group and you also have a tutor. And I had a brilliant tutor called Claire Allen who wrote Poppy Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. um, who's very, a very voice driven novel, very voice driven writer and teacher. And I suppose for me, like working, so she was always very good at saying like, at one point, you know, when I got to the end of it, she was like, you are the worst judge of this book right now. Like you, you've got to, you've got to believe other people when they read it and give you feedback now. Um, but I suppose coming back to the voice, for me, sometimes I'd read stuff and say, well, Rachel wouldn't sound like that. Or now my new person, I say, well, he wouldn't sound like that. So I'll read it back when I'm editing. Like, oh, he's gone out of character there. So it's like, it has to be consistent. Um, he has to be true to himself, I suppose, my current person. And the same with Rachel is would she or wouldn't she do that? Obviously then you can get a bit too safe, can't you? And then the story can be a bit boring. So it's like push her as far as I can while she's still just about believable. So I suppose it's voice, but in terms of getting the words on the blank page, I'm like really childish. I have to do things like put chocolate at the edge of the desk and <laughs> I've written so, so many words, I'm allowed a piece of chocolate or I'm allowed to go to the toilet. It's it's like being at primary school. It's really pathetic. Well, and we know we know from <laughs> earlier that, that you had to have the um you had to have the, the puppy there, didn't you, as well? Yeah, so that was so she would have been the perfect excuse. That was it was a good job that we got the puppy while I was still on the MA with really set deadlines. Because I think after that you could use a dog to lose loads of time, couldn't you? And then your deadlines would flip. Um, but I think yeah, that was it was a combination of the deadlines and having things like chocolate. Um and like I say, the emails were shorter. Uh, I tend to like, if I can't, if I'm not getting anywhere, I just have to set myself a word count and get some rubbish down. Same thing, like get something down. Cause it's really easy to go days without writing anything. And then, and then it's harder. It gets, it's like a spiral then I find. I wonder so. if, if I, if I could ask you and, and then maybe we'll get the others to, to chime in too. I mean, evidently doing the MA was a really important uh, part of, the, the journey for you, part of getting whatever it, whatever it was that it gave you. And people talk about different things, don't they? they? Say it gives them confidence to share work or it gives them a discipline, gives them a sort of permission sometimes. I mean, do you think if you hadn't done an MA, this book wouldn't have happened? How do you feel? I mean, impossible question to answer. Yeah, I think, I think it probably would because I was desperate to write it. And so the thing that I applied for the MA with, you know, you had to submit 5,000 words was the opening to this, but in third person. So Rachel already existed in my mind. She'd come to me a couple of months before I applied and I'd started writing. I think if I hadn't met Claire Allen on the course, I don't know if it would have been such a strong first person voice because she just really pushed me to experiment. And so I think she would still be, Rachel might still be third person. And I, I feel sad about that, but obviously mm. I wouldn't know the difference. Mm. But, so I, I'm glad I had that. And I, it, the deadlines were good. I don't think as a journalist, you're kind of okay at setting deadlines, I think, or, you know, being frightened of them at some point. Um, but I don't think I would have found the time. I, th I don't think because the children were smaller, small children and a job at the Guardian. 
and trying to write a novel. If something had to give, I, just, I try and do all three at once. I'll do all three badly or I'll do one of them badly. And I, you know, I was lucky enough to be in a position where I could just do the MA and be with the kids. And I've had a lot more time with the kids than I ever did. And the age they are, I'm just really glad about that. I'm just really, really lucky. So um, just to, to, to sort of underline something you're hinting at there. I mean, Poppy Shakespeare is a book that came out a long time ago now. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful novel. So for people wanting another uh, recommendation, I would second uh, Poppy Shakespeare by Claire Allen. Now, um, just to say we have just a few minutes left. If you have a question that hasn't uh, been asked or answered yet, please do, please do let us know. I'm just going to go on to, to talk to Louise and Helga a little bit about this idea of creative writing. Very, very useful for, for some people not what everybody needs. What was your, your experience? Louise, did you do any kind of formal sort of training as it were? No, I, I, I never, I didn't go to university. I didn't do particularly well at school. Um, I, I think English was the only um, GCSE that I got um, a good grade in. I didn't do very well at all. I always thought, oh, I, I didn't have much confidence. I always thought I wasn't particularly clever, but I felt like I came alive when I wrote and I felt like that was the one thing I could do um, and kind of found my voice that way. Mm. Uh, yeah, because um, I actually got pregnant while I was doing my A-levels and I now have a 30-year-old son, which is crazy. Um, so, yeah, so I didn't go to university. I, I, don't, I, I often think, how would that have changed things for me? Would it have made it happen faster? Because I didn't get published till I was 44. So... I don't know. I'm not sure. It, it may have helped me, might it? Might have opened doors for me that took longer to open, and maybe I had to knock a bit harder to sort of get in that room, so to speak. So, but I'm, mm. I'm now glad it happened that way, um, and that I kind of just taught myself to do it. Yeah. Well, you know, there are many, many roads in, and also many times in in life when you'll get published. You don't always have to get published when you're. 20 uh do you um Helga what about you what, what did, did you what was your sort of you know kind of formal background yeah uh well I got a uh I think it's an MA right uh mm -hmm. in Norwegian literature and language uh from university and then I went to creative writing school in Norway which uh who is called Vesterdals and it's uh and that was actually where I started on my first novel at, at that school, which, which is three years and mainly in advertising. So I was planning on a career in advertising, but then luckily I got, uh, I got published when I was 25. So I didn't have the time. <laughs> yes. The world of advertising loss it their loss, but I, I don't I, think so, but yeah, <laughs> I kind of feel that this is a better career path for you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to quickly, we're going to welcome, um, welcome Karen back in a second, uh, but I'm just going to very, very quickly ask each of you just to say what you're up to at the minute. Um, that is not, I always have to say this to writers, me saying, how many words have you written of your next book? It is not supposed to be uh, something you can give a good or bad answer to, but is there something else in the works that we can look forward to? Um, Louise? Um, I just literally finished my uh, next Arenda book. Um, so Karen probably doesn't even know what this is. So all, I, all I'll say is, um, I don't know what genre it is once again. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's about um, two sisters who were separated during childhood and um, one of them is now a pianist. Um, so I had to do a lot of research because I don't play music. And that's all I'm going to say. So I'm at this minute, I'm between books because I just finished that. So yeah, I'm between books. So now it's, now it's have a summer off, we say. You've earned the summer not. off. <laughs> <laughs> Helga, what, a, what about you, Helga? Well, as Louise, I'm between books, a long between books. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. And, and Katie, the, the, second, the second novel? Or yeah, the second, second novel. Um, so... There's quite a lot of death in it again. Um, I don't want to say too much, but it's about, yes, it's about someone going home to a small town. He goes home to a small town because his father's ill and it's learning, it's that kind of like, what do we owe our parents? Um, he's putting his life on hold. He's exactly in the middle of his life. Um, yeah, my daughter says I should just call my books the death series. Uh, 
for that because well, there that's is exactly the kind of cheering from the sidelines that we expect of the younger generation isn't it uh you don't have to you may but you don't have to listen not to put pressure on these new books because we have a whole load of reading to do with these uh I really enjoyed reading these books. Thank you very, very much for talking to us. I'm going to hand back to Karen and to say thank you to her and to all the Arenda staff um, for, for having us this evening. Karen, over to you. Oh, thank you, Alex. I could have listened to this all night, actually. I'm really sorry that we have to bring this to a close. And it was interesting to hear what my authors do next, though. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> tells me. Till it arrives, especially with Louise. So it's okay, what do we got here? Um, but I do firmly believe that authors should be allowed to write what they need to write because you get the best books that way. And Helga, I have the benefit of Helga's un un untranslated backlist. So I can keep publishing it for ages while she decides what she's going to write next. And that's not an issue. But what a wonderful evening. Oh, this was fantastic. I mean, I, I would like to say one thing that was brought up about literary fiction. So it's, it's, I use that term just really to make it clear that these are special books, that they're beautifully written books, that they're books that you won't just read and reach for the next one. You'll stop and pause and think and you'll remember those characters and you'll probably learn something from the book and come away maybe a little wiser. And I use literary fiction to describe my crime fiction too. Um, and I don't like to use the word women's fiction or the term women's fiction because these three books are, they loads of men have loved these three books because these are about people and and men like to read about people too I think <laughs> so that's anyway that's my that's my explanation and I really hate an industry where you have to pigeonhole things and you know I remember with Louise's first book they said well where should we put this this was Waterstones and I said, just on the front table, that's fine. Um, because, because she always read it just to like mix up a few genres in a single book. Um, you know, there's no easy way to define Louise's work. I, I noticed that that Linda, who's in our in our audience, has just uh, put in the chat box a humane fiction. Right, exactly. And I'd also say thank you very much, Alexander, who asked that first question that kind of got that ball rolling. Because it's exactly. It's a really, it's a really good one, and it's a tough position for for publishers to, to try to define the indefinable and and put something into a category um, when it often doesn't really belong in one. I mean, with, with when we publish like Helga, a Norwegian author, I have to draw comparisons. But I have to say that when her agent described her books to me, not even this one, it was the Afghanistan trilogy. She told me about it and I just thought that sounds so much like Anne Tyler, where you're dropped into the lives of a group of people and nothing really happens, but it's over and you're bereft. And that was exactly what it is. And I thought, wow, perfect. Um, anyway, I'm, you don't need to listen to me. We've had four wonderful women speaking to us tonight. Um, so I will just remind everyone who's hung on and missed the beginning of the football. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming and remind you that Dulwich Books do have signed copies of all three books and you can get your exclusive Jubilant June tote bag if you order all three and um, I think we're going to have to have a, a best question. What do you authors and Alex think about the best question to win our tote bag? Or well, should we just do them all? Do them all. All them, all them. Okay. Let, okay. Let's well, all have tote bags. Everyone who's asked a question gets a tote bag. If you can, if you can message me tomorrow on Twitter with your address, I will, I will ensure that this happens. But for now, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you so much. Thank for you. Having us. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.